Welcome to this Saturday Travel and History Tip, and we will be going to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and the State Museum. We have been to many state museums. I have to say they are all fantastic, and I encourage you to visit any state museum that you can get to. Since its creation in 1905, the State Museum of Pennsylvania has collected, preserved, researched, and interpreted the culture and natural history of the state. Over the years, the museum has greatly expanded its collections and modernized its public offerings to serve the needs of succeeding generations of Pennsylvanians. First located next to the Capitol, the museum moved here in 1964. There are four floors of interesting things to see. On the first floor is this large statue of William Penn. It was designed in 1965. The statue depicts William Penn as a young man infused with a deep sense of need for civil and religious liberty. The small figure represents humanity, protected by Penn's ideals. The quotation behind the statue is from a letter written by Penn in 1681, announcing the founding of Pennsylvania. The Commonwealth is named in honor of his father, Admiral Sir William Penn. They have the 1681 Charter on display, and the Constitutions are also on display, like this one, which is Pennsylvania's second Constitution. This one was dated September 2nd, 1790. These are historic flags that are associated with Pennsylvania. They are reproductions of the flags representing the European powers or individuals with claims or interest in the land that would become Pennsylvania. Some of them are reproductions of Revolutionary War era flags. They had the typical evolutionary information on dinosaurs and geology and space, but we will focus on those in some nuggets. But for the Saturday Travel and History Tip, I'm going to keep it a little lighter. They had these great dioramas of animals like this one of this bison. The scenes were exceedingly realistic and they went into great detail explaining how they built these. To create realistic snow and ice requires a naturalist eye for detail. Of all the diorama elements that have to be created, snow and ice are especially hard to fake. The original museum artist as well as the recent restoration team observed closely how snow drifts, lays on the ground and collects in pine needles in nature to create wintry diorama scenes. Artists also put wet looking finish on the rocks in the wolf diorama to make it look as though it had just rained. I thought this was really interesting how they give you some back scene pictures and tips on how they made these things look so lifelike. They had a huge section on man and machine, technology in Pennsylvania, Conestogas, canals, and this part that was machines that begin to free the housewife's time. You could spend hours upon hours and probably days or a week consuming all the information that was available at this fabulous place. They had this part about Three Mile Island and many of you would be familiar with that. The accident at Three Mile Island was a setback for the nuclear power industry, but it would not be the last or the worst. And Three Mile Island was located right there in Harrisburg. The transportation section included this great old boat and these old planes, old ice trucks and fire engines, and one of the best displays on roadways we have ever seen. This display was dedicated to the Pennsylvania Turnpike. It was America's first super highway. It was built in response to the need for safer, faster, and more direct route across the Allegheny Mountains. The Pennsylvania Turnpike became the nation's first modern super highway when it opened in October of 19. 19- 40. The Turnpike's original 160-mile section, combined with its subsequent extensions, ushered in a new era of modern interstate travel after World War II. This scale model shows the eastern portal of the Sidling Hill Tunnel. It was a phenomenal and extensive display on the construction and how it worked and where it's going today. Where it's going today is exceedingly high prices, even with Pennsylvania Easy Pass. One of the things that I enjoyed was seeing this USS Pennsylvania Silver set. We'd seen the one that was on the USS Arizona when we visited the Arizona State Capitol in Phoenix. This one was also gorgeous. The Commonwealth commissioned this elaborate silver service in 1904 for the USS Pennsylvania, the second Navy ship to bear the state's name. Crafted by J.E. Caldwell and Company of Philadelphia, the 162-piece set depicts many of the people, places, events, and things for which the Keystone State is known. Take time to look 
look at the detail on these amazingly ornate pieces. This was one of the most exciting things to see. William Penn and George Whitehead penned a serious apology for the principles and practices of the Quakers in 1671. The authors explained the beliefs and practices of the Quakers in response to an attack on their faith a year earlier by a Presbyterian clergyman. A book plate in this copy identifies it as having been William Penn's personal property. Things like that are just really exciting to me. There were so many beautiful paintings and artifacts that have been found across the state and are representing history and have been protected at this wonderful museum. And of course, you can't talk about Pennsylvania without talking about steel and iron ore or the Civil War and Gettysburg. A curator was standing in this Civil War section and I asked him what was his favorite item in this area and he took us to these two items. One of them is this Confederate battle flag. Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Blakely of the 78th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry donated this captured Tennessee battle flag to the Pennsylvania Adjutant General's Office in 1895. As the official history museum of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the State Museum continues to collect significant Civil War artifacts and preserve them for future generations. Items like William Pritner of Philadelphia's gray uniform coat. When the war began, the grays became part of the 17th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment. The Philadelphia Grays took their name from the color of their uniforms. Before the Civil War, both northern and southern state militias wore uniforms of different colors, including blue and gray. The United States Regular Army wore blue uniforms, so the Confederates picked the other common militia color, gray, for their army uniforms. I always wondered why they had blue and why the others had gray. Now we know. And they also had this host of old battle flags. These battle-stained banners. After the Civil War, the Commonwealth began amassing objects associated with Pennsylvania's contribution to the Union cause. Some of these items were official and ceremonial, such as flags carried by state-organized regiments. We will talk about Gettysburg after next week's Saturday Travel and History Tip when we talk about things that were made or companies that are associated with Pennsylvania. To do it justice, I will wait and present that information in next week's Saturday Travel and History Tip. Hope you enjoyed, because this is all a part of American history. Learn it. Love it. Appreciate it. Don't let them steal our history. Teach children our American history. Hope you watch the Saturday Travel and History Tips. Thank you.